Hello, everybody. Greg Lake with the Theo Connect podcast. We are bringing it back. I know probably about a year or so ago, I've done a few episodes and life happened. And uh, but here we are. We are back uh, and we're going to continue to do this podcast. We have the website's going to be republished hopefully within the next 30 days. People feel free to go pre register there. And actually, there's a free PDF of my book, my third book, uh, if, if you feel so inclined. Uh, today, we have Jahan Kamsezade, uh, a, a, a guy that I've known ever since I published my first book, uh, Psychedelics and Mental Health Series. Um, I remember when I first published it, which can be a scary process, right? Especially if you haven't really been in the space. Um, but he early on reached out, showed support, uh, discussed with me his dissertation, which is now uh, his book. Uh, and I'll go ahead and say the title is called The Psilocybin Connection. Psychedelics, the transformation of human consciousness and evolution on the planet, an integral approach. Jahan, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I hope I did your introduction some justice. You did great. No, such an honor. And I did mention I've been looking forward to having this with you for a while. Yeah. So real quick, your background, um, you know, leading up to this book, uh, what all studies had you done kind of leading up to prepare you for this undertaking mm. book? Yeah, it's been about a 20 year process. I had a huge psychedelic experience at 18 that radically transformed my life overnight. Um, but from being atheist and depressed to all of a sudden understanding there's a spiritual reality. And I wanted to understand the intersection of science and spirituality. So I went in as a neuroscience major for a semester. And then I took a physics course from a professor that was also deeply loved knowledge. And he was like, if you want to understand the universe, you have to know physics. So I did physics and math for three years. Had another mushroom mushroom experience, and it said to leave physics. That's not what your soul's wanting to know. It wants to know mysticism. That's more like your karmic path. And I was like, that's not a profession. That's not a major. You know, this is not a part of our society. So there's a lot of fear in leaving physics that I thought was more socially and economically grounded. And the closest I can get to study mysticism or what made sense to me at the time was philosophy. So I majored in philosophy, mitered in physics, mitered in cycle, and class away from math, and then moved from Tucson, Arizona to the Bay Area. Uh, to focus on consciousness, which was, again, more encompassing. I got my master's in consciousness and transformative study to JFK University, then went for the doctorate in philosophy, cosmology, consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And I had been aware the whole time that the greatest expansion in my consciousness had been because of psychedelics. And I'd done a lot of therapy, a lot of community work, a lot of meditation, all the other kind of methods. And at the end of the day, it was psychedelics that really transformed me the most. And so I wanted to do my dissertation on it. With the focus being on Terrence McKenna's idea that's come to be known as the stone ape theory, but uh, I haven't been the big fan of the name because the apes aren't necessarily stone. I mean, you're in a high mystical state, it, it, so I think we need to reword how we approach it. Um, but during that time, I also wanted to have a deep experiential grounding in this work. So I took multiple trainings while working on the doctorate, uh, including two years of somatic psychotherapy training. It's called Hakomi. Then for several years, studied in the Mazatec mushroom tradition, uh, went down with a friend Paul Borzat to Mexico and, and trained with the Mazatecs there. Then I assisted for two years at the psychedelic, psychedelic certificate training at CIS. I came back and I mentored for a year at the School of Conscious Medicine. Um, and it's been full on. I now also hold legal still seven ceremonies in Jamaica. Nice. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And I tell you, uh, CIS, you know, I had... But whenever I was going through school or college, I had no idea about CIS, but, you know, I studied law. But now I think if I could do it again, I think I would probably go to CIS because they teach on a lot of subjects uh, that I have a lot of interest in and thankful that that you did attend and are able to put out this good work and inform us. You know, obviously, uh, the psychedelic and theogenic medicines used in different contexts is growing larger every day. Uh, so the need for people like you with this in-depth knowledge and experience uh, grows again daily. So thank you very much. Um, kind of shifting to the book, you know, and, and, and kind of the stoned ape theory, right? Um, about kind of the idea of the relationship between man uh, with psychedelic mushroom and how we evolved. Um, do you want to kind of get into that a little bit? On totally. Take? Let's, let's, let's go for it. You know, uh, <laughs> I was definitely enthralled. I think by age 15, by the existence of psychedelics, the idea that I could just take something and it shift my perception made me really question, well, how can we ever trust our perception and why is it so easily shifted? And I went through a lot of um, existential anxiety by my teens, like, why the fuck do I exist? Why is anything here? How did this come to be? You know, from all the way to Big Bang till now. And there's this huge missing element of how humans emerged. 
so much of the other parts of the story for the last 14 billion years, we can kind of piece together, but there's this large level of emergence in our consciousness, including brain development within humanity. Um, I read Terrence McKenna's book, Food of the Gods at 19, I'm, I'm 38 now, and I focus on the transformation and evolution of consciousness through this entire time. A lot of different models, theories, you know, archaeological evidence and so on. And I had to come across a better theory in 20 years of how we emerged. Mm -hmm. I felt it was the most scientific, the most rational, the most grounded explanation um, and deeply experiential. I mean, we could take these medicines again today and see the deep impact they have on us today. And we're just extrapolating that that was also available for our ancestors. You know, as um, Paul Stamets, the great mycologist points out, the most common mushroom in the African savannah is the psilocybin variety. There's over 200 different species of psilocybin mushrooms found all around the world. And so for Terrence and Dennis McKenna, who first proposed this theory, it was a very simple explanation that there was a consciousness expansion that happened in human history. And so they might've taken a consciousness expanding compound. Super makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it, right? And, and it turns yeah, out yeah, the psychedelics yeah. are prolific. They grow in almost every ecosystem. You know, there's over 2000 species of plants that have um, DMT in it, right? So they're a part of the ecology, have always been, they've been here far before humans will exist far after. So the idea is because, you know, when you're working with law, um, they weren't illegal back then, right? There wasn't any social stigma. So once you came across it and if they were good and they've helped people as they do today, they would have helped them back then and they would have integrated and become a part of the society. And we know now and in the last 10 years that it's psilocybin stimulates neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons, the brain physically begins to grow. It also hyper connects the brain, creates a state of neuroplasticity which makes it easier for us to learn and become more creative, right? So again, the idea is this happened over and over for generations, for not, maybe not even millennia, for millions of years, giving us the hardware that we have now and uh, the creation of a lot of culture for all the way from language and art all the way to mathematics. That ability actually arose from us from these psychedelic states. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, unfortunately, Terrence isn't with us today, but I think that there's a lot of new archaeological and anthropo anthropological evidence which has further gone uh, to bolster this notion of the relationship between man and evolution. Am I correct? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, 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 I got a hold on the theory for about 20 years, but there's about five years of just dedicated research on it. So I provided almost every evidence um, I could find, not just lines of reasoning, but tremendous archeological evidence. There's all the neuroscience, there's all the ecological explanations, you know, why these plants grew and how they affected us. And it, there's about 70 pages of how it would have affected culture, you know, early culture. Um, cave paintings around the world, we're talking about all over the Europe, Asia, Africa, show uh, mushroom use going back some of it 10,000 years, you know, all the way, because the first kind of creation of largely formed pieces of art. And then when you come to the Americas, because there's a migration of people that came out 20,000 years ago, you have all of North, Central, South America uh, with mushroom relics. You know, there's about 200 different mushroom stones left by the Mayas going back um, two to 3,000 years. And there's cave paintings of mushrooms all found throughout Mexico. And we know of indigenous mushrooms within North America. So it, it, we're, we're saying that this was a global phenomenon. It was, it was a big part of our culture before we left Africa for a few million years. But once migration started, a lot of these patterns still continued. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and we were kind of discussing before this, but, you know, as I do law, you know, trying to put historical context to a religious practice helps validate it to a certain degree, right? So, you know, when I read Michael Winkleman's work discussing that in all major areas of the world, like you said, in antiquity, we have evidence of at very least uh, psychedelic mushroom use, and and I might butcher this a little bit, but Michael Winkleman, he, like our shared world religious heritage, um, do you think that, so the mushrooms, like, do you think eventually they started to elucidate religious thought along those lines, or maybe man started to be able to put words and comprehend uh, some of those visions that they were having on, on, on Very the much, and I think that's the key point. Um, I think it's going to take a while for our culture to grasp onto the idea because it's such a different paradigm. You know, yeah. and so it's going to have to do, it's not that the logic and reasoning isn't there and all the evidence, it's going to be like, well, I have to completely live one way I saw the world, you yeah. know, but this new paradigm that we're proposing is one that it's deeply interconnected with nature. We're mm -hmm. saying that there's plants in the environment. I mean, plants, for example, they create most of our oxygen, they create your body mass, you know, they, they kind of make so much of our being already. The idea is that they also cultivated a lot of our intelligence and our depth of spirituality. 
Um, so it, I think it gives a very ecological, neurological and chemical grounding for the emergence of religion. If I see it just for myself in my personal life, just as a microcosm of the macro, I was an atheist and had really no opening to any spiritual reality until mushrooms. And it shattered that whole paradigm in three hours. You know, that's yeah. all it took. I'm like, oh my God, God's real. That was my experience. And it's just that we are love and we are light. I mean, nobody could have rationalized me into that. I'd gone to church for many years. I read a lot of religious books and it all seemed so distant because I didn't have access to that direct experience. And here we're talking about a compound that very safely um, interconnects your brain and allows access to it. And so, you know, in terms of um, the historical use, all our cultures date back to some level of shamanism is the first form of religion. Again, it's a very fundamental understanding that it was the plants and the environment that had a huge impact on the way we saw spirituality. And the shamanistic worldview is, is known as animism, that the whole world is alive, that nature itself is alive. And I think that's a very also common perspective when you take psychedelics, that the whole world's talking to you, everything's imbued with a level of meaning and a depth of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's very much grounded historically, yeah, for us. Yeah, and, and as you talk about, yeah, I remember when I wrote my first book, you know, one of the parameters that they were measuring in a lot of these studies was nature relatedness, right? And they saw that psilocybin, and I'm sure there's evidence for a lot of others, but particularly psilocybin, increased nature relatedness. And, you know, I think that's the mushroom speaking to us in a sense, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. You know, I thought for a while, again, how and why do these exist? Even just from an evolutionary standpoint of why would nature create this compound? You know, not even having to go all the way out to like a spirituality, but just from um, almost a survival perspective, uh, why would psilocybin even be created? And for me, one bigger insight that kind of helped ground it, and I think is what we can see a little more science-based by, by measurements, um, was Richard Doyle's work. He wrote um, uh, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and Evolution of the Noosphere, and he, he's a professor at uh, Penn State University. And he read thousands of trip reports, and he said that the common psychedelic insight is that the participant realizes they're part of a vast interconnected living system and they should re-return re ecodelics. So placing that, that we're extrapolating from a lot of people's experiences, we're seeing that the compound grows all over the world that primarily stimulates ecological awareness. And when I say ecological awareness, it's like the awareness of our relationships and relationship to the larger whole. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of incentive of why an ecosystem would create that. It, it would create that to create a sense of balance within all the organisms. And uh, is Rupert, Sh not Rupert, Sh Berlin Sheldrake, you know, Rupert Sheldrake's son pointed out in his a more recent book, um, Entangled Life, and he, uh, he was a mycologist, he said that psilocybin is probably at least 67 million years old, right? So this has been a part of the ecosystem used perhaps by all, a lot of other animals. And there's a good book by Giorgio Saramani called Animals and Psychedelics. It documents how many other animals use psychedelics. So this has been a part of the natural process always throughout nature. What separated us is that we had brains primed for it, it's being primates to really make most, and also we had a, you know, thumbs and hands that we can create tools with. So while other animals might have some level of psychedelic experiences, we are really able to terraform the planet, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, human, as far as the the, the planet, you know, uh, in destruction, humans are by far the, the more dangerous of the species, right? Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back a little bit, you know, you talked about you were an atheist and really had no concept mm -hmm. of God, you, you know, before I really adopted these substances as my religion, you know, I grew up in a Christian environment where God was a transcendent other man in the sky, you know, that, that mm -hmm. would punish you for de bad deeds and stuff, right? Well, the, the main awakening I had in this was just realizing that, it, you know, and this is all my, my perspective is that God resides within and with everywhere, right? And, and you experience mm -hmm. that cosmic unity and realize that, we're no different than any other thing in manifest reality is, is so powerful. Um, and, and I just see these when people have these experiences it empowers them to such a degree that it's just completely transformative. Um, and so I wonder, too, if nature also put a little bit of that in there, you know, in order. And, and it's just the timing and sequencing of all this. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, our plan coming up to a critical area, you know, and then right at the same time the psychedelic renaissance is kicking back up and going full speed. Um, you know, I, I have a sense of divine timing and also have a sense that mushrooms as a sentient being are, are pushing themselves out there. 
No, absolutely. No, I, that, I think this is what happens a lot in psychedelics. You realize you're part of a vast interconnected consciousness. Mm-hmm. Somebody like Carl Jung, the depth psychologist, he didn't take psychedelics, but did a lot of internal imagination. He would say there's a collective unconscious, this large container that's very archetypal and, and that we all share. And there's main motifs and ideas that run through all our entire species. But from my experience, this collective unconscious can be very conscious itself. It's a very like, much like a super mind. So it's not like it's just the dream world. The dream world itself can be very, very intelligent. And if we look at like the living systems, for example, ecos- like our body, for example, it knows how to self-regulate itself. You're not sitting there trying to think, my, keep my heart pounding and put blood to all over my body. I mean, we have like 37 trillion cells. It's a huge process. It does it on its own. It grows out of an ecosystem that's also very, very intelligent and learns how to move chemicals around to maintain balance. And the earth itself is doing this. You know, this is the, the kind of foundations of Gaia theory. So from this level of complexity and self-organization also re- comes out compounds that also fit within, I'll use psilocybin, the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor in our brain better than serotonin itself. No biotoxicity and creates a hyperconnected brain state. So it's a very intelligent process, not accidental in anywhere of the least. And if the whole idea is to create ecological balance, the same way a hormone in your body might signal to the parts of the body to create balance, the idea is that the, the environment's trying to do the same. And that even on oh, a incredible. deeper- incredible. So the- Go for it, tell me. Yeah, yeah. So like what you're saying is that the, the, the ecosystem senses that there's stuff out of balance. And so through the mushroom, they send certain signals to us uh, in order to try to correct our behavior to, to help it. Yeah, man, that's absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the plants do it out of itself uh, in terms of nature. And there's also, you know, I think the deeper kind of spiritual part of nature that we're, our brain is entangled with all other brains. You know, it's a big part. It's just like we're a very large mind. So it's also happening in ways that for example, if I'm looking at LSD, which LSD is derived from ergot, a type of fungus itself, it was discovered the same year that we created the nuclear bomb, right? And so he yeah. came through all the yeah, yeah, mind, yeah. yeah. And it, he created it, and then a dream told him to go back and look at this compound. It's really important. I mean, it shifted culture tremendously, you know, LSD. Yeah. And so there's ways that I think it's, it's coming into balance because we are at a point, you know, where in systems theory they call it a bifurcation point where the system can unravel and fall apart or it can organize at a new higher level you know we can either tear apart the planet or come into greater level of empathy and awareness of interconnection because we realize we could destroy everything you know so and i think the mushrooms the kind of and a lot of psychedelics expand our consciousness to become awareness of that interconnectivity so we can behave differently yeah it, it, I want to go back to, you know, you were talking about the discovery of LSD, where I think you said Albert Hoffman had a dream that told him to go back. And so I'd read an article in researching for my third book uh, where Albert Hoffman said that he believed that the divine was absolutely involved in this discovery. And, you know, obviously you're aware in the space, there's a lot of people who only will consume natural uh, entheogens and disdain anything that's man-made. But, you know, in my opinion, it's all divine and perfect, right? That like the discovery of LSD, which actually spurred research into psilocybin and other things too. This was all part of the master plan, right? And so, you know, while I did subscribe to this all natural at one time, like through doing my research, I now realize and just don't question anything that that like even MDMA and all this stuff that's that that Shulgin did, you know, it's Mm -hmm. all perfect and divine timing and really coming to fruition and manifesting now. Yeah, I, I definitely understand the uh, the point of view of only liking things that are quote unquote natural, meaning uh, just produced in nature. Uh, but a lot of these compounds, we're just tinkering with small little atoms. They're derivations from other compounds found in nature. Um, so they can be quite, I think, amazing. Um, something that I helped me internalize, like real, be okay with other compounds, is that even because they're so close to the compounds found in our ecosystems, they might have evolved on other planets, right? They might be natural in other compounds because a different level of complexity of compounds will probably evolve, you know, in the other parts of just say our galaxy. And so LSD might very much naturally grow in nature in other places like ours. It, it's a very close derivation to what's already found in ergot, you know, and MDMA is very close to mescaline. And so mm-hmm. if nature just tweaked itself a little bit, it could create those compounds. And so the ideas in other ecosystems, other than the ones that we, we know of, they might naturally, you know, grow themselves. Now, here's a mind bender for you. And you might be aware of this, but there's a compound called silomethoxin, which I believe is 4-hydroxylated 5-MeO-DMT. Well, how do you, you can synthesize it, but you know the way that I've known people doing it is mm-hmm. they basically feed free base 5-MeO-DMT to a mushroom substrate 
and the psilocybin, the mycelium, four hydroxylates it and it inserts it into the fruiting bodies, right? And mm-hmm. I recently learned that I think back in the 60s, there was a scientist that was feeding all kinds of tryptamines to the mushroom. And not only did it recognize it, it four hydroxylated every single one of them uh, and, and burst out a whole new compound uh, in the fruiting bodies. Wow, that is so beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was another thing that kind of got me uh, thinking yeah, yeah that you know we call them synthetic but you know if if nature recognizes it and works with it you know like who <laughs> yeah you know it just kind of yeah. blew my mind i think it's just the form with all the other technology we have just because we created something doesn't even the whole i think it went to go back a step deeper i think just judging anything isn't helpful right putting anything in the category is bad just because quote unquote nature itself didn't create it we are and every way, shape, and form an extension of nature. Our mind is an extension of nature. So our hands and our and our intentions and our creativity is what we do. It's one seamless flow, us and the planet and the universe, right? And so yeah. I think it's, you know, better question to be asked is like, well, is something harmful? You know, because natural not doesn't matter. If this is toxic and it hurts your body tremendously or could be lethal, does it hurt other people? I think that should be the guideline, whether something's appropriate to use or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so to kind of shift real quick, and this is a question that I've, I think I might have asked you before, but I don't know, when we talk about sacred mushroom ceremonies, and I know that you've been to Mexico and studied with those people, you've done a whole bunch of historical research, right? What are some key components you feel if, if mm-hmm. people are going to participate in a ceremony or conduct a ceremony, what are kind of some key elements that you think that maybe the mushrooms respond to well or, or key things to help people kind of have a good, smooth uh, experience? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't overtly say how many okay. ceremonies I've seen. Right. But I've wondered yeah. tremendously of why some people, even off the first go, have a tremendous breakthrough mm-hmm. and others it's barely there or not existent. And I think there's a lot of factors, including the person's sensitivity Mm -hmm. uh, in general as a human and and self-awareness to the heart. So I I know if a person has been a really good person and they've been really in touch with their heart, it's almost as if they're almost easily granted access. Okay. Right. You know, so I think our history plays some role um, and the way we've showed up play some role to how much we're able to receive at any given moment and that doesn't mean other people they don't have that uh, also there's other people i've seen you know, i've seen so many people change their lives overnight mm-hmm. and uh some of those people all, all good people but they've been in tremendous pain for decades and it's almost mm-hmm. as if the pain itself acted like a rocket fuel for them to launch you okay. know and it really burst forth so i think there's a lot of pieces of of why some people really break through i think at the end you know more of a blanket response is prep is good for everybody. Let's take this really seriously. I like when people do a lot of research, they do a lot of self-work. It's very intentional. You know, they come in with the right state. Um, and I think the hardest part of the work is working with expectations. You know, there's a lot of people with tremendous pain and they're like, they want this to shift their lives overnight. Not a guarantee. It can happen. I think it happens for most half the people, not guaranteed, you know, but um, because they're stepping into something so unknown by its nature, You know, they come in with all their hopes, dreams, fears, but it's also them working with expectations and with their fears. That's what helps them throughout life, period. You know, so even just going through the mushroom process, whether something happens or not, I think can be a deeply life transformative and healing. You know, over the years uh, working with with the mushrooms, I built quite a relationship with them, right? And many times they speak to me during these experiences. And and I'll never forget one time they kind of relate it like this, that We are part of nature, just like you are. But like, you know, when you when humans go out in nature, you might come up on a wild animal. Now, how your fear and apprehension, a lot of those animals can sense it and it freaks them out. Right. And and, and they might be liable to it. So they kind of told me like that, like, you know, when you come at us with less fear and apprehension, we're going to be easier on you. But sometimes whenever you're fear and apprehensive, it freaks us out. And then here we go. (laughs) Lost in this entanglement. Uh, So I've always told people, but again, uh, for me, I think a lot of the key is is the effort you put into it, right? Like, what are you doing to prepare for this? Um, you know, just, just showing up and doing it and shoving mushrooms down your throat or you're actually like showing up, done some prior work, whatever that might be, and and actually having respect for this as, you know, I'll say sacrament, but just having some type of reverence for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, in my opinion, from what I've seen, goes a long ways towards helping people have a good breakthrough or at least a smooth experience. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I love that. Um, like the metaphors that come, what I say to a lot of people that come into the journey work, uh, to treat that day itself as if you're going to the spa, like come in relaxed, open, ready for anything, tension, but coming in relaxed is very helpful, more like of a meditative state compared to any kind of fear or tension or else like you're holding on and you're not letting go. And the other metaphor that comes on is like going on a first date, you know, it's just end of the day, it's like coming in relaxed, it's just better. Uh, the person that you've been up to that moment is going to be some level of transparent to this other human, right? So just being a good human period is always helpful for any time yeah. you go on a date and also come into here. So the point of the psychedelic experience for me is, is for people to live a good life, right? Mm -hmm. And the more you start that now, the better your journeys are going to be, but your life in general. Yeah. You know, when I first started having mystical experiences, um, I was, I was addicted to opiates and alcohol at that time. Right. And I would have these mystical experiences, but the whole time it was like, until you kick this, like we, we really don't have much. I mean, they were, it was very loving, but like, you know, you're, you're only going to get so far until you kick this. Right. And I just mm -hmm. remember like crying and, but the mushroom was like hugging me, like, it's going to be okay. And then seriously, when I went and got sober, and did write for two or three years, then came back, my experiences were of a completely different nature, full blown mystical, you know, experiences, and just so enlightening. And, you know, one thing I like to say or, or discuss is the ineffability of some of these experiences, right? There's certain parts where like, literally the insights and what a lot of us say downloads you get are so profound, that it transcends human language. Do you believe that that's still a level of understanding that people are in here are, are, are you know, coming to embody? Like, do, do they take that with them, even though mm -hmm. it's not something that they can necessarily conceptualize or speak? Totally. I mean, I'm still integrating uh, my similar experiences for 20 years ago. Like, it's a very much a living presence. It's still transforming me. I've been grateful to work with clients that I'm seeing them years out. And their mushroom journeys have been the transformational point in their lives, you know, all the way, even if they're starting in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or sometimes in their 70s. Um, I think one way to see this in terms of a model, there's this uh, Hindu philosopher, his name was Sri Aurobindo, and we have this idea of evolution as if it's moving up towards spirit, but he also had this process called involution of spirit coming into matter, like we're kind of going up and it's coming down. So in terms of a download, it's like we're getting something from another realm, you know, and using like a metaphor of computers, it's like we're connecting to a networked large central server, this huge universal mind, and we're getting downloads. But our culture doesn't know how to frame things yet. We don't know how to contextualize it. We don't know how to communicate about it. Uh, Terrence McKenna, for example, he had this line that the, the process and progress of our species is limited by the evolution of our language. We don't have language for all these things yet, so it's hard to anchor in. But the felt sense in the body, the experience, the visuals, like even though we can't translate it yet, it, it changes us inside and out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you too, kind of along what you were saying with other people's experiences that when I, I, I did a long stint in inpatient rehab, 32 months, but I tell you, a lot of those downloads came back to me and it's still not something that I could express, but it's like I picked up on spiritual principles, which I feel are important for a good recovery. But I picked up on them very, very quickly. And I was able to see, you know, when I picked up on them, I was then able to identify these things playing out right in front of my eyes and further validating, you know, these ideas and stuff that I got. And I just inherently had the sense that, this was all coming back from these prior mystical experiences that I had and, and, you know, gave me a leg up in recovery. Totally. I mean, that's amazing. I, uh, I don't think a day goes by where I don't think about my personal mystical experiences and whether I've gone through addiction, heartbreaks, life challenges, it's, they've been the greatest resource for me. I'm like, you know, whatever I'm going through, I'm thinking like the deeper reality is this other thing experience because I knew that at that moment, there's like 110% real, like they have been my lifeline. You know, many, I, I don't know, maybe I would have killed myself after a teen if it wasn't for them. You know, they've definitely been the, the guiding lights in my, in my life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, let me ask you this. So here's how I kind of see this movement going. Right? I see it as three. And, and, and when I say movement, let me define that. The push towards legalization of indigenous mm -hmm. or psychedelics. I see it kind of mm -hmm. moving along three lines. You know, we have the decriminalized nature movement, the, you know, that are more localized stuff. We have... Uh, the research in the medical, you know, uh, movement, which is obviously gaining a lot of steam. And then kind of where I work in is this religious 
uh, you know, I say church, but religious movement, right, where people are now using these. And again, I say the word religion, a lot of people have trouble with it, but as it's defined in law in a religious mm-hmm. manner, and mm-hmm. I see it all kind of working in unison, in a sense, even though we have a mm-hmm. lot of people on the religious end that say the medical people are terrible, and probably medical people saying these people are out of their mind. But I really see it all kind of coalescing together to help the larger society come to understand and accept these things and and realize that, and it's hard for people to say this sometimes, but that essentially we were lied to for a very long time, right? Um, And it it kind of goes back to, to what I was saying before, is that when we look over history, the spiritual, ritualistic kind of religious use was the norm uh, all the way up until then we get to the 50s, 60s, where they started researching. And then shortly thereafter, this idea of, uh, you know, uh, recreational use came about, you know, uh, mm-hmm. do you kind of see it, this, this movement progressing along those lines? Oh, I mean, so many, yeah, I mean, there's so many ways I think we can break this movement down, you know, definitely grassroots level of the decrim. I think there's a large federal level. Um, yeah. I think projected legalization for psilocybin MDMA is next year, 2023. So that's going to have a huge impact. There's definitely the more medical scientific. And then there's also you saying more like blurring the lines between uh, church and state and everything with the religious rights, which I think is absolutely on point. And, and there are deep common threads, you know, having met a, a lot of the people that led some of the clinical studies with psilocybin were deeply spiritual people that were motivated by spiritual impulses. You know, they had experiences like this before, and that's why they chose things of like focusing on near end of life anxiety. They knew these kind of mystical experiences and with other humans and let's help people that are about to die. And that's, they could have gone many directions and that's what they chose to do. And the first really big studies were on, you know, some of the first on mystical experiences all the way back in Harvard, the Good Friday experiment. So we knew early on, even from a scientific standpoint, that we can now look at even religion from a scientific uh, viewpoint. And there's a big difference between the historical religions and this, where before people, you could say, like, meditate 10 or 20 years, and maybe you have a mystical experience, you know, yeah. or, or we just have to take your word at it during the scriptures, but now we can almost reliably produce mystical experiences. You know, studies show about 67% of people in right side of study. So now mm-hmm. because we can reproduce things that follow a scientific method, we can actually deeply inquire what are these religious states that we're having. So for me, it's more grounded religion than any of the historical religions, because we're not relying just on texts or people's, you know, anybody can have this pretty much. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that, that part's really big. Uh, I don't think we need to put each other at camps and we're all wanting the same thing. Yeah. And there's many yeah. ways of looking at reality, you know, me personally having it, but then also having uh, verified information that we can do over and over. I, I don't think we would have gotten this far without the scientific research. We can all yeah. point to it and we're like, hey guys, this is real. It is solid. We've been doing it for decades. This is fucking amazing. I think that played a huge role. That being said, I don't think it's appropriate for us just to wait for science to catch up, right? There's people that are suffering now, dying now. Like we're holding, I think, back yeah. the greatest treasure that humanity can ever experience potentially, right? Yeah. And so that means so we need to claim that right. And I think doing it the way you're doing it in terms of law and being like, this is by its nature is deeply spiritual. It is our human right. And it's also a right that we can figure out how to work with uh, within the United States. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, it, when we talk about primary religious mystical experience, well, that's played out in the research, right? So the thought that these people are now communing together in a really religious ritualistic fashion is really on mm-hmm. par with the science that we can all agree on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of when we define religion in the law, it's really a lot of religion by analogy, right? So mm-hmm. in my book, I, I talk about integration, you know, to me, integration providers are really the, the the psychedelic and theogen role that a pastor would play, like a Christian mm-hmm. pastor, because, mm-hmm. you know, what a pastor is essentially doing is getting up there on Sunday or whatever the, the holy day of the week is and reading the ancient primary religious mystical experience and then trying to tell you through their interpretation how to relate it to your life, whereas now we have integration providers who are working one-on-one or in groups with people to help them make sense of their own primary religious mystical experiences, right? So mm-hmm. there is a lot of common overlays between these things. And, you know, again, I think kind of switching people's frame of reference to understand this, right, um, is going to be key for, for a lot of people to accept that, you know, now nowadays we're, we're kind of, and I'll tell you this too, you know, when I first mm-hmm. started church work, I thought I'm influencing the future of religion. But really, what I realize is that I'm just helping continue on what's always been in existence, right? Yeah. And uh, 
I feel like it always will, because I'll tell you one thing I read in my research is that the secondary religious phenomenon, you know, that, for instance, like with the Catholic Church, eating bread, drinking wine. And there's no I'm not saying anything bad about mm-hmm. that, but history has shown that over time, those things kind of get less and less effective for people to really mm-hmm. connect with spirit. Right. And I think what we're seeing now is just a move where people who were either part of these religions or atheists um, who still had that innate drive to connect with spirit uh, are coming back to the original source for these experiences. No, deeply, deeply, deeply true. I feel very fortunate. I've helped hundreds of people take psilocybin and, and have this kind of breakthrough. And my main motivation internally of, of, for personal reasons was I wanted to be there when they saw God. And I'm using God again in a not like religious, like historical yeah, religious yeah. sense of just a because that was been the biggest moment of my life. And I'm like, I want to be there. It's like seeing a flower open. I'm like, when people like just wake up, you're like, if you want to leave, I don't know of anything more beautiful than me seeing that. And uh, about 70, 80% of the people that come, come because of their pain. They're coming because of trauma. Mm-hmm. And unknowing to them, it kind of leads them far deeper. And from what I can see, and I think the science is really kind of, um, uh, kind of supporting this, is that mystical experiences can be the most healing experiences that we have. You know, it helps kind of let go of all the childhood trauma, the sense of alienation in society, the not belonging. It helps us see our interconnection. And that there's correlations that the science has shown between how healing the substance is and how much of a mystical experience they have. So mm-hmm. even though, and so for me, the work is, is primarily spiritual, even though it's under the guise many times it's psychological. Yeah. You, you know, I noticed in my own journey that, you know, the healing qualities of these, it's like very basic fundamental understandings that you come to, right? Like the unity of all things. Well, God, how can I go out from here and treat other people terribly uh, if I've experienced this, this unity with all things, right? And so, because mm-hmm. because a lot of times we talk about religion and the law, they say, you know, have extensive moral codes and things like this. Well, the, these entheogenic religions don't necessarily have all that. I mean, they have some, some moral mm-hmm. code, but but it's really based in the experience, right? It's like, yeah, but our people have experienced cosmic unity and, and what that informs them about the way they treat others, treat animals, treat all these things, right? Is inherent in the experience. It's phenomenological. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I'll go back real quick to the DEA SoulQuest letter. You know, the DEA said, oh, well, you know, SoulQuest doesn't have people sign their statement of beliefs for they participate. To me, that's insincere when we talk about these visionary religions because the beliefs emanate from the experience. So if I haven't bought the ticket and took the ride, if me signing this paper is insincere and farcical, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, and I'm noticing that, 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 you know, it's just very experiential based and there are a lot of common threads that run through them, but also too very individualistic. You know, what I bring to the medicine, to the ceremony is going to be different than the person next to me. We all carry different loads. And while we do get these common denominators, a lot of it's very specific to the individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I love what you're saying. I think yeah, we are unique individuals and it responds to us all uniquely and in uniquely almost every time. And under that, there is this larger, deeper shared reality. And for me, it's just, as you were saying, it's like uh, the way I take it is almost morality and ethics are intertwined to the fabric of our reality. When we look at and we come to that conclusion that we're all one, that everything has this deep unity, we can also say interconnection, uh, we show up differently. There's ethics that just come with that. You know, everything I do affects everybody else and everything, and it comes right back to me. Um, And also, if we also see everything as sacred or part of the divine, I show up with everything with a different level of respect. Mm -hmm. Plants, animals, humans, myself, right? And so there's an inherent shift in in my moral viewpoint or my my standing as a human, and even as a personality, just by seeing the structure of our existence. We respond to our reality in a different way. Yeah. And and one other thing I've realized in this church work is the power of community. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I remember the first time I ever went to an entheogenic church to a ceremony. It was the first place I'd ever been where the only requirement to be accepted is just to be your true authentic self. You know what I mean? And people loved you for that. You could be vulnerable and people didn't talk down about you. They wanted to try to help you through it. And I think that there is incredible healing power uh, just within the community aspect as well. No, totally. I mean, what the shirt you're wearing was where it's like, what I see with psychedelic cultures is like, there's more inclusivity of everything and everybody, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. whether it's, you know, from sexual orientations to other evil religions, to the way people relate to others uh, from polyamory all the way to, to monogamy, to, I mean, everything across the viewpoint, it's just so much more inclusive because there's this deep feeling of like, we are one. 
But mm-hmm. why would I create a division between us and somebody else? Because you may have a different belief or because you were born in a different place or a different color. I mean, all those things feel silly. If anything, the differences bring kind of beauty. They bring something new to the table. Like, what can I learn from our differences? It's more that instead of pushing somebody out for having them. What are your thoughts on the idea? And I think maybe Terrence McKenna said this. Sorry if I get the source wrong, but they said, you know, the psychedelic experience isn't about create. And I might have been Stanislav Grof that said this. You know, it's not mm-hmm. about creating beliefs. It's about shedding beliefs, right? Yeah. Uh, thoughts on that as far as like, you know, we're, we're not mm-hmm. building. We're actually yeah. shedding what I call mind programs, you know, shedding these new mind programs from a fresh perspective. Yeah, totally. I think that runs through a lot of just the psychedelic history. I think that would be all the, the people you name would agree. And that in terms would say a lot, like, you know, beliefs are almost a sign of like your death. And I think uh, Timothy, Leary is saying, Timothy Leary was saying the same thing, you know, and I ever know Terrence was saying, like, create your own roadshow, like a place where you are with the people around you, be creative and create a new reality. Um, it was in that book, um, Animals and Psychedelics, you know, that, that the botanist Giorgio Saramani proposed that one reason they both exist in nature is to create a sense of, um, deconditioning and so animals including ourselves um we follow patterns and habits you know whether they be physical habits you know emotional or psychological through beliefs and for a moment those habits are suspended and it gives the ability for new patterns to arise you know so for somebody to say in a christian or any kind of other paradigm that they just it's the water they've been swimming in a lot of it's just unassumed it's stuff they've learned from three years old and five years old goes unquestioned and it, then you have this reality check for several hours. Is that even true? Does is that resonate with anything I've experienced? You know, you can let it go if it's not even helpful or actually describing reality, and that gives space for new things to arise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, incredible. And I, I love Terrence so much. He said that he had a quote that that really has been inspiration to me. But it's basically the effect that you know shed the fear and jump out there. The universe is a feather bed, right? And ever since I heard that, it resonated with me so deeply and resonates with my experience with the medicine, right? That, yeah. that it's a feather pillow, shed the fear and go for it, right? And you're going to mm-hmm. discover that really the universe is there to support you. Totally. I know. I love that line that he used. And also another one where um, nature rewards courage, <laughs> you know, just all across the board. You have to end of the day. And I think he's a big proponent. It's like, do your research. You, and so this is safe. This is true. This stuff works. You know, trust yourself and then jump into the unknown. And something that I think psychedelics help us do and I think with a lot of clients, including myself, is relate, change and transform our relationship to the unknown, to the mystery, which I think is a deep part of reality. End of the day, none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. We can take assumptions, but it's that level. The future by its nature is unknown. It's too many variables. No human knows it. And so what do we do that we exist in this reality that there's an inherent unknowing as part of its structure? I could be scared because I don't know, or I can relate to it as something divine and beautiful and an awesome mystery that could bring gifts. It could, it, anything can happen. But I also can believe that I can handle myself. You know, So my ability to know I can rise up to challenges is also really helpful. You know, so it's a deeper trust in self and deeper trust in reality. I think that we really cultivated by going into this deep mystery many, maybe perhaps several times. Yeah. Um, you know, you've made kind of references to this shift in consciousness, this collective shift in consciousness. And I completely agree with that. I see it happening right in front of my eyes. And I'm a big subscriber to the law of one, which talks about switching densities and stuff like that. Uh, what what exactly is your view as far as what's what is occurring and what is going you know your hypothesis what will occur uh, in the future? I think we are going through a massive shift on so many levels and we could look at it from so many ways. Um, there's a book I, I love does um, called The Empathic Civilization by Jeremy Rifkin. He's a great sociologist. Probably really likes my kind of books on, on on economics and sociology. But this is a, a ginormous book where he really breaks down and shows all the evidence throughout human history that we're actually becoming more empathic. But at the same time as we're becoming more empathic, we're also using more resources, you know, so they like for electricity and so on. And we're becoming more empathic because of the technology, right? So we're growing in empathy, but we're also growing in entropy that the planet's destroying itself that we're growing, right? And so when I look at either this model, you know, or lots of others of the evolution of consciousness, there's a development taking place. We're definitely growing. And for me, psychedelics give me more hope than anything I've come across because transformation can be a very slow process. It's very rare that a human sits there with a level of discipline and focus and and just on their own and decides, I want to grow. First, they have to realize that they can grow and that we're evolving as an individual and as a collective 
not on large, large scale, like species develop at like eight within a lifetime. I think that's one breakthrough. And then fossils like integral theory can kind of map out development. But then it's such a slow process, maybe what years of meditation, years or reading. But to have a state experience where that can shift in one day, I don't know anything else that does it. Some people like maybe one in a million get it by grace, where one day they're waking up and they have a spontaneous spiritual experience on its own. But we, that's too slow, you know? And so for a time where we need collective quickly healing, this is available. And again, grounding it, because I think some people for a more traditions, tradition, tradition, kind of religious background even like say like hinduism or buddhism or like it comes through prayer or meditation and, and just sitting for them they still see psychedelics as something outside taking something artificial and again we have to like really contextualize it. this is a part of the ecosystem that's always been here right again this is the way that planet kind of moves forward so ken wilbur really broke down he studied hundreds of models of development and he says the four main ways we can look at is people move from being egocentric focus on herself, to ethnocentric, focus on like a tribe, like a nationality or religion, to world-centric, so realizing that the planet, we're all the same kind of people, including connecting with the biosphere, you know, and to being cosmocentric, eventually there is, there's something more than just our planet or material reality, we're connected with some kind of more universal spiritual world also. And so I think collectively, we're really making that movement from ethnocentric to world-centric, you know, away from just our nations and governments and, and our religions, so more of a cohesion, you know, the, the, the ecological kind of devastations we're going through, whatever is happening in the other side of the world affects us here, you know, so we're realizing that the boundaries we create are just artificial, like we're really, really connected. And I think that's something psychedelics wake us up to just inherently. So, so I think that's happening and it's going to be painful, you know, but, but it's happening fairly rapidly, much faster and accelerating than any other point in human history. Yeah. And, um, um, what was going to say, and, and obviously technology, social media, things like that are helping play a role in making us more world centric, right? Yeah. Huge. I mean, when I had my experience 2002 Tucson, it's like I had nobody to talk to for like seven years, right? I moved yeah. to the Bay Area, found others, and like here we are, you know, like you wrote a book within, the, I think, a day or two. I found out, I reached out, you have this podcast, mm -hmm. you, you, you were telling me just how many organizations you're helping right now, lots of community. My schedule just also packed doing this work and so it's just it's because of technology yeah. that we're interconnecting and i think the external interconnection that we're having through technology is an expression of the deep internal interconnection that we experience right we have this huge interconnection of consciousness we experience but it's also the external world becoming more interconnected unified and i think technology technology is playing a really important role in that incredible um, so I was going to ask you about one point in your book, and, and you might not, it, it might take a whole dissertation to describe, but the integral theory, uh, hmm. could you touch on that? I mean, hmm. at least generally or briefly, or is, is yeah, it too much? Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's complex, right? But I think it's really important. It can be very helpful. Uh, there's a lot of philosophers in the last, you know, 100 years that helped out, but it was really kind of formulated and put together really well by Ken Wilber, and he's written um, 25 books on the topic. And he was a systems thinker, was, was first going to school for biochemistry, kind of dropped out, got really into Eastern traditions. And he played a big part in unifying Western psychology with Eastern philosophy um, and looking at models of development. Of, again, with the Western psychology, with all the science of like how do human beings and personalities and values develop, right? And he was able after a long time to see a unity in all this phenomenon that there's, there's certain patterns that people follow when they develop, whether they're using something like the chakra system right? Or they're using the scientific method here. There's just levels of, of, of emotional intellectual development that happen. And, and so there's patterns. He really synthesized it and put it down very well. And another, I think, big contribution he had was these terms of the quadrants. Um, so the idea that there's just four boxes and everything can be seen this from this perspective is a singular approach, right? Like I'm talking about me as an individual or as a collective, I'm part of a larger whole, right? So those are the, the top and bottom of the, these two. And then it's also split in half between internal and external. You know, there's this internal individual experience, but there's internal collective experience, like the collective unconscious. And then there's this external phenomenon of, of an individual being like my body, but there's also the systemic ecological or more kind of systemic like law kind of phenomenon where we're, we're connecting many bodies together, mm -hmm. right? And from this perspective, it's very comprehensive and you can kind of describe anything, nothing's really left out. And so integral theory by its nature is using the word integral like integration or mm -hmm. like you're integrating many perspectives to creating unified phenomena, but also like integrity. You know, that's getting, there's a cohesion between the system. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what the philosophy puts forward, but it's also did a lot of job looking at the history of humanity and how paradigms and worldviews have evolved. And also 
the values that may be ahead of us because we're not all in the same place. I, I love one of the like lines that the future is already present, but it's not evenly distributed, right? Like we're all in the same world, but living many worldviews based on right. what's available around us. Incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah, man. Um, we're kind of running out, but is there anything else you want to talk about related to your book? Another point you want mm-hmm. to make? Um, again, it's um, everything in there is gold. So I just want to make sure that you you get a chance to, to nice, reiterate yeah. anything that you yeah, want. Yeah, no, no, honored. Thanks for people listening, great spending time with you. It's uh, the psilocybin connection. It's found on all the platforms, you know, Amazon, mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble, Google Play. Uh, the audio book will come out on May 31st. Um, this years of work. I'm glad to have it out. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah it, you know, this movement gives me tremendous hope. It meets amazing Absolutely. people. And I just hope it re enlivens and lights up hope for other people also. You know, mm-hmm. if you haven't had the experience yet, uh, keep with it. I hope you, they find the resources available. I hope they get the legal protection they need uh, mm-hmm. because they can be very wholesome. You know, and I think we have to recontextualize these as these are very wholesome. They create a wholeness, but they also heal fractures within ourselves and our community. And so yeah. I hope they're really seen within that light. Yeah, you know, and, and I say this too, is that, you know, people who go and have these experiences and start their healing process, then carry that energy out into the world and they're better mothers, fathers, you know, in, in all their relations, you know, and then that energy spreads, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like this, uh, this effect that these ripple, these waves that go through every time someone has these experience and really does the work and starts to get healed up just the domino effect that that has on other people it really gives me faith that that what we're doing is going to have a very significant you know impact on on society and the world at large and uh you know again doing the work i do i kind of have a front row seat and it's just every single day i'm just amazed at and one thing i'll say how inc- people coming into this space how incredibly talented smart and a lot of resource rich people are coming into it and and all these pieces are kind of coming together. I said I was at a psychedelic networking event at South by Southwest in Austin, maybe a month and a half ago. And just the energy in the air, man, of people getting together, hatching plans. I mean, there's no telling what's going to come out uh, of, of that, that that networking event, you know. And But I think it's kind of indicative of the larger movement, you know, in California and other places where, People at the cutting edge of all kinds of industries are coming together and trying to figure out how can we spread this far and wide uh, in a beneficial way. Yeah, I I know of no more fascinating and exciting field. Yeah, yeah. It keeps me coming back every day. And again, congratulations on your book, Jahan. I mean, I'll say this, you know, writing a book is very tough, but it's also very rewarding. You know, uh, just the amount of opportunities that have come to me through writing Mm. the book you know, and, and you, a lot of people, it's that first line or paragraph is between their good idea and, and publishing a book. And I just encourage everybody to do your brief outline and go write that first sentence. And I promise you, I mean, you know, nine out of 10, you're going to end up finishing the book. And I'm, I'm like the idea. Yeah. And no, so again, it's very inspiring. It was amazing how, how quickly you got on it and went through it. And I was very yeah. happy to, uh, to see your name out there listed when the first time I saw it. Yeah. And one last thing, you know, it's like when you're following your higher path, I think you're calling. It's like these things tend to come easier to you. And so I also encourage people, look and see what resonates with you and follow that path, because I think that's where you find most self-fulfillment and able to contribute the most to the collective. Totally. And I love that. I think just like our bodies, the planet creates what it needs. You know, like we need a stomach, we need a heart, we need a lungs. And so we need people to play other functions in society. So I think within us, it's like we're born with a sense of purpose to do something very specific or many specific things. So it's following, like you're saying, that impulse, that calling, the excitement that brings that fruition to the thing that we're perhaps we're all actually needing. Yeah. 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 Well, Jahan, thank you very much, man. And and I hope that we connect face to face. And and definitely we're going to have you on again as we continue to develop. And and maybe one day I can show up where you are with a camera and some microphones and we can sit down and have a cup of coffee and have another talk. So honored, man. Cool, brother. Well, I appreciate it. Likewise, brother.